I'm so, so excited to be here in conversation with my friend, Deepam, Susan Watts. I've known Susan for a long time, and I would call her a writer's writer and a writer's friend. She is encouraging, she is warm. If you don't know her, she is the kind of person that you can talk to about anything. I remember clearly at Harborfront some years ago when they were awarding the first place for the Writers Union of Canada Short Fiction <coughs> Prize. She got it. <laughs> and it, it was, I, I remember thinking at the time, well, bloody well about time. You know, this woman is a wonderful writer, very supportive of other writers. Those of you in the room who are writers, you know this already. She's just naturally a warm, curious person. She asks good questions and is a deep thinker. I'm going to start with asking you if you would just share some of the words from the book, Susan, with, with the room. Yeah, Ruth, oh my God, thank you so much for doing this. So I'll just read the opening uh, pages of this book because I think it sets up all of the themes that you're going to find out about. <clears throat> when Michelangelo peeled the skins of cadavers, he was searching to uncover a mystery beyond how muscle attaches to bone. In the dead, I search for something beyond a tag to identify a dog's owner. I clamp on my hard hat as Mel eases the truck to a stop. The dog at the roadside is a mixed breed with a delicate snout and brindled coat. A turkey vulture drops a rope of its intestine and lifts away into a hard blue sky. Overhead, the big bird carves a dark circle while Mel drags the shovel out of the truck bed. Even though I know the dog is dead, I squat to touch it just in case. Its jaw gapes, its legs are stiff as branches, its milky eyes open. There's no tag. I touch a rib bone that pokes through the skin like a tire spoke. Was he abandoned? Or did he simply leave the scent of wild things pulling him from the safety of home? Mel drives a boot onto the shovel's edge, shovel's edge and begins to dig the hard packed summer dirt, releasing the scents of metal and stone. The only sounds are the steady rasp of Mel's breathing and the crunch of the shovel. We didn't bury my sister Goldie or my father. After the fire, they brought two clay urns to the edge of the Kootenai River. The wind picked up the ash and bits of bone, casting them in a wide arc over the cold river. Before it settled, a gust of wind caught a handful and flung it into my mouth. When we slide the dog into the hole, its skull shows white through the split in its fur. This doesn't cause me to gag the way it used to. I still smell smoke, though, whenever the dull moon of an eye lies exposed like this. Mel labors onto one knee and opens his fist, letting a confetti of tobacco drift over the small corpse. I keep my eyes on the still form while Mel lifts his head to intone a prayer. I hear Nimush and the Gwetch, the Ojibwe words for dog, and thank you. The first roadkill I buried was a fox. Nothing about it seemed dead that cool spring morning. It was as if the fox had simply lain to rest in the middle of the second line. The white tip of its tail curled over the sun flare of its body. I sensed Mel's focus on me even though he faced straight ahead. I removed my gloves to search for a pulse and found a hardness that made me rock back on my heels. Wagoosh, Mel said. The fox smelled of juniper and cedar. Turning my head so Mel couldn't see my face, I heard the metal on metal of the shovel across the truck's side. It was the prayer that undid me the soft syllables like a lullaby. Once we were back in the truck, Mel touched a finger to the box of tissues tucked into the console and started the engine. I yanked one, turned away, and made as if to check traffic through the passenger window. Mel's the only one I ever want to ride with, the only one who's never made lame lunges to grab my ass on the pretense of helping me into the cab, and the only one who doesn't bitch, not about the weather, the road conditions, or his wife and not even about the cutbacks that have forced us to drive the snowplows without a wingman. 
After we've mounted the earth and tamped it down over the young dog, I toss the shovel into the truck bed and step up into the cab. Mel has the truck in gear. Teach me how to pray, Mel, I say. Without turning, Mel lifts a gray eyebrow. You pray to real things like animals. I need you to teach me. His answer comes like it always does after a long pause. Don't pray to animals, pray for them. Now he half turns, almost facing me, to give thanks. I want some of what he has, that steady sweeping gaze over the land, the ease with which he dangles his fingers through the steering wheel, the slow nod when one of the good old boys at the yard calls him chief. Is that what makes you peaceful? Praying, I mean? Peaceful? He says, as if trying out the word. Yeah, I say, how does it start? It sounds like bonjour. Bonjour, he corrects. We say bonjour, gemnado, means hello, creator. The other things you say after that. Mel nods, returns his gaze to the road. Mishkiki nini dishnikas is how I start. I try out the words, but they feel like pebbles in my mouth, and it looks as though Mel is trying not to smile. What? You said my name is Strong Earth Man. Well, I like that. How do you say my name is Strong Earth Woman? The smile that was forming vanishes. There are these times when I feel I've stepped over some sacred invisible boundary. It's in the density of his quiet, as if all the light has been sucked into a vacuum. What did I say? I lean my head into the window and see through the outside mirror that we've done a fine job. Not even a ripple in the gravel remains to, part, to mark the spot where the dog is buried. In the beginning, I try to insist we find the owners, but if the animals aren't close to a house, the mandate is simply to bury them. No time to go calling, calling door to door. Mal, what should I say? Easing his foot from the brake, Mel turns the truck back onto the road. Just your name. Can't I have a cool name too? We're on the road heading south on the lookout for roadkill, bent signs, and potholes. Sun comes hot and thick through the heavy leaves of maple, oak, and poplar. When Mel doesn't answer, I turn to look full at him. Mel, how do I get a name like that? His eyelids lift and it seems to take some effort for him to focus. He blinks. The fingers dangling from the top of the steering wheel tap at air. I've screwed things up. The long silence makes that clear. I want to apologize, but I'm not exactly sure for what. Okay, so no special name. Okay, so how do I say it with the name I've got? The hard line of Mel's jaw softens. You say your name, then Ndishtikaz. The sharp sound of my name, Brad, is jarring when followed by the warmth of the Ojibwe syllables. I want a name that's tough and wild, like Cougar Woman. But given that the man I live with is much younger than I am, it might not be the best choice. <laughs> and given that my request has been met with Mel's inscrutable silence, I decide not to push it. After a second attempt at Brett Dishnikaz, I say, what do you say next? From under his eyelids, Mel watches ahead through the sun-stained windshield. I say, Ramadunjaba Wawaskashidodum. This invocation flows like a song, warms me right into my belly where it's been cold for some time. Does that mean I'm from Rama? Mel nods. And the rest? My clan. You have a clan? What kind of clan? Dear. On the far side of the road, guard posts list toward the ditch, their guide wires stretch tight. There it is, I say, pointing. I don't have a clan, I say, as Mel swings the truck around in a smooth U. So what would come next for me? Just where you're from, then Dunjaba. Where I'm from? Where your heart is, Mel says. But they're not the same place, I say. That's all you get. <laughs> is a really, she's a very powerful character. But I'll tell you, um, there were so many times I wanted to hug her, and then I wanted to kick her in the butt, and then I wanted to take her hand, her face in my two hands and say, really, Brett? You know, like, give your head a shake. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, I mean, <laughs> You aren't the first person to want to give Brett a good shake to slap her upside the head. So, yep. but the thing is, it, to me. The
this is more realistic because um, <laughs> we, we are not all these amazing heroes on some majestic crest. That's We're right. holding our little secrets and our little, mm -hmm. you know, shame close to our chest. And it renders us, well, not us, but very, lots of people. Sure. Um, just still sure. unable to move forward. Sure. Um, so that's I, that's why I did that. You know, I'm one of um, in a in a retreat uh, writing retreat when I was working this out, one of my fellow writers is like, so why the hell does she want to die? Why has she got such a love affair with death? Right. And I'm like, well, she wants out. You know, she's yeah. suffering, and she thinks that's that's it. So it's an intense journey with her, and it's almost like almost like a quest, right? Has anybody thought to overlay quest onto this for you? In a manner of speaking, it's a because it's an inner quest as yes. opposed to an outer quest. It's certainly not the you know, the typical hero's journey. Um, but yeah, definitely would be a quest. I mean, in her question, teach me how to pray. Mm -hmm. that, that sets it up for, for mm -hmm. you know, I, I need to know how to rectify these things in my past. Sure. Although it's on a very unconscious level. I mean, it's always there for her, but she's not recognizing that it is, in fact, a quest. Oh, of course She not. just wants to keep it. Yeah. <laughs> and yet Mel serves as kind of the, um, well, he's kind of the tutor figure, right? Um, teaching her. Um, but not even being aware that he's no, teaching her. No. She, 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 she layers on poor Mel, you know, project. This, this wise soul. And every so often, you know, he kind of pops up with like, what, <laughs> what, whatever. There you go. Yeah. Oh, he is hilarious. Um, I love this bit. This is from chapter nine. They named Chicago after them. Lots of skunks in Chicago back then, I guess. When we get back in the truck, Mel turns on the radio for some news about another shooting. Funny thing, he says over the announcer's jaunty voice. The word for skunk and the word for white people sound pretty much the same. <laughs> I want to read one more little excerpt. Life is divided as if by a fallen tree in the forest, on the far side, before the fire. The woods surge with vitality and light. Creatures and flora, buds and tendrils, Spanish moss, golden larch, clusters of purple and white, orange and yellow squeeze-headed flowers, porcupines with quiet quills and bark-filled teeth, weasels and ferrets, sleek auburn foxes and singing coyotes, pussycat-faced cougars and bears too. On the near side, where mama has lived forever after, the earth itself is scorched, bereft, smelling of singed hair and pungent salves that don't soothe. On this side of that dividing log, for 27 years, mama's feet haven't danced, her hips haven't swayed, and her eyes don't focus on anything I can see. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. I remember that was written in a prompt, from a prompt in an AWA workshop of Sue Reynolds. So Cole is an interesting character um, because he's, what, 11 years her junior? Yeah, 10. Thereabouts, yeah. A nice uh, saving grace sitting there for her. And for me, that's part of her quest. I'm just thinking of, of the process <coughs> that you go through when you're writing now you're talked to you've mentioned that you go to um sanctuary sundays fabulous right um has all of that book come from that well no not all of it um because you know i like to cite sherry coleman talks about mm -hmm. a sacred image oh the sacred heart of the story yeah, yeah. and that was actually um a, a road a woman on a, a road crew um you know because they always have the, the stop and they're never really on the no and i know I, and i it was a, a what if okay there's my image 
And in there, somebody says, oh, all those gals are hot blondes. And I thought, well, yeah, a lot of them are pretty good looking, but what if they were down and dirty? And you know, so mm -hmm. what, would that, what would that character be like? So the character came not from a prompt, but from that. Right. Um, <coughs> the situation that Brett finds herself in is, is when I found myself in. So I wanted to explore that, but I didn't want it to be a memoir at all. So she's right. not me. She's, well, she's kind of the dark side of me, but um, but this how she deals with it is not me. Yeah, I, w I was with it. I just want to say that the backstory is expertly delivered in this novel. You know how sometimes you can pick up a novel, you go, uh, you know, the first seven pages is kind of setting up what's come before here, um, and you avoid that beautifully. Brett's backstory, and parts of it are horrific. And parts of it are lovely. But of course, that too is life, isn't it? Right? And she's smart, which is great. And she's dumb, which is also <laughs> great. Right? <laughs> Very human. Yeah. Yeah, I w yeah it's just uh, you know, to address that, I wanted to make her well read. Oh, yeah, she is. She's great. traveled. So, she, you know, I, I just, I, I love mixing it up. That, you yes. know, she's driving a snowplow, but, you know, she's been to. No, she hasn't been to Bali, but she's been to India. Um, yeah, and she's read all of the classics and, yes. and that sort of thing. And I, and I just thought that was fun. You know. um, is there anything else you want to talk about no, with the book? Not particularly. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yes. Sorry, I was curious about her fascination with Bali. Oh, thank you for asking I, that. Right? Yeah. So years ago, I think when she was still alive, and I read Anais Nin had written, right, that she wanted to die in Bali because they celebrated death. She didn't get to, um, but I thought maybe, maybe I just gave that to Brad because I thought, you know, and I remember looking up, researching and looking at the, the, the clothing and the kind of things that they do for you know, celebrations and parades and whatnot. So I've never been to Bali. And she doesn't get there either. <laughs> Not in this book anyway, maybe in the sequel. <laughs> but uh, that was why it was just this is very exotic, beautiful, and really it came from Anais Nin saying that she wanted to go. <laughs> yes. And, and you also mentioned like, are you thinking of doing a sequel? Or, <laughs> you know, because I'd like to know kind of what then happened. Right. Is it, yeah. Because yeah. in the in the Toronto launch, Richard asked that question. You know, what would what what's next? And and I said, well, I can't really say because he said, what would the sequel look like? And I said, well, I can't really say because there's a turning point in the book that I don't want to tell people about till they yeah. read it. Mm -hmm. um, but then he but then he asked, so how would Brett be like? What kind of a you know would she um, you know what kind of a life would she be living? And I that I could answer. Okay. Uh, but I don't think there'll be a sequel because she's going to be um, more receptive, more loving, more available. I think that when you come to the end of the book, uh, you're going to see that it, it has a, a hopeful ending. Right. Not a happy ending, but it's a hopeful ending. Any Thank other you. question? Yep. Ah, Anna. Yeah. Anna. Um, yeah, I was curious about um, the cover art. <laughs> Uh, well, there, that's the dog. Yeah, right. that's, <laughs> that's the dog she has. You get, I got a questionnaire, a really long questionnaire. What's the tone? Who are the people? What kind of da 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 da? Very extensive questionnaire. And are there any animals? Well, yeah. And uh, so I said, and that was it. That's all we got. It was the dog, um, and uh, so when I, uh, in tears, <laughs> sent my email to my publisher and said, "What is this?" Um, she said, "Well, what do you want? A dead dog? We can't put a dead dog on the front. <laughs> That's the alternative. That's it. <laughs> so like a dead dog or a live dog. That's what you know." So. <laughs> Um, no, so that was, uh, I think, they spelled my name wrong. Uh, they, it's fine now, but oh. it was, it had Susan P. Wads. <laughs> and um, <laughs> this, this copy has Lauren Carter's. The one that Alyssa, yeah, Alyssa's used to be in on the ARCs, on the advanced reading copies. It was Alyssa's, the one on the back about um, 
a woman drawn to self-destruction and desperate to live mm -hmm. was a better sort of counterpoint so that people wouldn't think that it was a dog training manual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to say that, that Beckett is in a lot of scenes and he's kind of a buffer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he's a soft place to land in a lot of the really intense scenes. So, you know, I, I've come to appreciate it, and as you can see all over my social media, I'm showing it because that's the book. But um, yeah, the cover art was my favorite. You know, one of the original titles uh, was um, Home Fires, but oh. the problem was when Sue printed it, it looked like Home Fries. So that, <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work either. <laughs> People just got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, what the living do is actually um, uh, the title of a Marie Howe book um, and a and a poem by her, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it, it's the same kind of thing, you know. It's this sort of what the living do when the ones that you love are gone. You know, yeah. we we go on. This is what we do. It's a perfect title. Any right. other questions or comments that anyone would care to share? Okay, well, eat. <laughs> Please eat. Thank you so much.